My goal now is to continue uh, yesterday's uh, lecture. So I'm just summarizing on this uh, blackboard what we have derived. Uh, we have derived using these various tools that I introduced the fact that this anti-ferromagnetic anti Hamiltonian for L, sp L spins sitting on a one-dimensional chain with even an even number of spins, we proved rigorously that there is a unique S2 invariant uh, ground state. <coughs> and uh, we did not need to choose a representation of SU2 for the argument, even though many of the intermediate steps were done implicitly thinking about the half, the, the, the spin a half, but in fact this is true for any SU2 representation. And uh, as you can, as, as you probably suspect, since we use very few actual properties of this Hamiltonian, it's a very general result. So it would survive quite general deformations. And it's a very, very general statement, and there is a lot of work people trying to generalize it to various other systems. The claim today is going to be more surprising. Uh, today we'll see that if the spins are a half integer, then the gap goes to zero in the continuum limit. While integer spins behave more normally, so uh, Marco uh, yesterday uh, made the point after my lecture that I should emphasize or remind you that if you take a normal uh, discrete system, like uh, some statistical system, and you take the continuum limit, normally there is no, normally there is a gap. So there is not going to be anything like that. The gap would just stay constant. The correlation, f the correlation length is a fixed number in terms of the lattice sites, and it does not go to infinity normally. Normally, it requires a massive fine tuning in terms of the lattice to find a critical point, what's called the critical surface. But uh, these models are <coughs> not normal, and that's why they're interesting. And you'll see the quantum field theory manifestation of this fact. Also, quantum filters are generally massive, and it takes a miracle for them to be massless. So there is something similar happening already in lattice models. In these lattice models, for a half integer spin, uh, the gap goes to zero, which is uh, an extraordinary thing. And today I wanted to show you how this is derived, what goes into that. And there will be some interesting lessons uh, that come out of this analysis. Are there any questions about the philosophy, the goal, whatever, yeah, or any homework exercises that you probably all solved. How specifically yeah. uh, would this property of the thermodynamic limit depend on the fact that L is even? So in defining the thermodynamic limit, you have to skip over the old Ls, because the old Ls cannot have a trivial ground state, because the number of spins is odd, so it cannot sit in a singlet representation, and the ground state is a twofold degenerate state, so it has a spin a half, well, it has spin zero mod a half, sorry, spin a half mod one. <coughs> the ground state would not be unique, and the continuum limit would not be very good if you did not skip over the odd, odd uh, lattice side, odd, odd configurations. It would not be continuous. Well, if you go over the even ones, then it's a continuous limit. Any other questions about maybe homework assignments, uh, whatever, before I plunge into the next? Statement, yes? What is the reflection? Yes, I think probably yes. Uh, I think it will map to some to parity in the continuum limit, which would be a symmetry of the underlying conformal filtering. So there will be some funny parity symmetry in the continuum eventually. If well, yes. If the gap does not disappear, how does the behavior in the like how does it converge to the value? So from the analysis that we're going to see. It's impossible to conclude whether it goes like one over L or whether it's exponentially small. And as we discussed yesterday, the two different, these two scenarios have a completely different continuum meaning. One corresponds to discrete, a discrete set of vacua with some finite domain walls, 
and the other corresponds to conformal field theory. So the analysis that I'm going to present does not tell you which is true. You have to do a little bit more work to find which is true. I'll tell you what the answer is eventually, but the tools here are not strong enough to, at least not the way I present them, they're not strong enough to distinguish these two scenarios. Okay, so the idea is the following. We have our ground state that we've constructed with a lot of work last time. It's this nice positive wave function that we constructed. And now the idea is that I'll, we'll find some funny unitary operator that would act on this ground state wave function and will generate a new wave function that I will prove is orthogonal to the ground state. And we'll also prove that the energy of this new ground, of this new state is, uh, is, uh, is just one over L compared to the ground state. So these are the steps. But uh, as you may recall, we did not use the translational symmetry T of the lattice very much. In our analysis yesterday, T did not play a role. It did not play a huge role that the, this Hamiltonian was translationally invariant. And today this will play a major role. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go through this derivation because there is a very deep lesson here. You'll see that translational symmetries on the lattice may not map to translations in spacetime in the continuum limit. That's why I'm going through that exercise. It's a deep <coughs> and surprising lesson. So we're going to use the translational symmetry and we're going to try to, 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 to do that exercise. In normal lattice systems, translations on the lattice do map to translations in spacetime, but not here and not in many other interesting systems in three dimensions that I'll mention tomorrow. So what is this operator U? So U is an exponential of 2 pi i over L and then sum over J as uh, Z J. And J just runs over all the lattice sides from uh, 1 to L. So you can think about it as a space dependent SU2 rotation in the Cartan. So if you're in the continuum, you would just think about it as a space dependent global tr symmetry transformation. So it's not a symmetry. It may change the energy. Why this operator is chosen? How did they guess that? Uh, well, this is the main result in the, in the work of Lieb, Elliot Lieb and collaborators. And I believe they probably arrived at that by numerical experimentation, but I do not know. Okay, so then there are some, a few technical observations about the properties of this operator that uh, you can easily reproduce as a homework exercise. So the first, we would like to understand what does this operator do for individual terms in this spin chain. So we just conjugate this. And we can also subtract, subtract the piece, the unconjugated part. So this is the first step towards understanding what it would do to the energy. So this is a small computation with SU2 matrices. There is nothing deep about it. Uh, you find two terms using the usual formulas for uh, exponentiation, you know, exponents of sigma matrices. The first term that you find is a, a half, if I did not make an error, 2 pi over L, and then you find S X I, S Y I plus 1, minus S Y I, S X I plus 1. So, not very illuminating, but that's the first piece you find. Yeah, and the second piece that you find is cosine of 2 pi L minus 1, oh. I forgot to say, the fact that integer spins behave more normally is what's called the Haldane conjecture, the Haldane gap. Okay? The Haldane gap conjecture. So the second piece is cosine 2 pi L over, over 2 pi over L minus 1, <coughs> a multiplying, a, mm, multiplying something that looks essentially like the Hamiltonian. So it's a I S I X S I plus Y I plus one A X plus S I Y S I plus one 
y. So this is kind of expected because the minus one is this. And SZ completely disappears because SZ commutes with u. So this is expected. So now to compute that, to compute the energies, we need to, to compute the energy, we need to sum over i, right? And then we're, we're good. We need to sum over i over this expression. And, I, and then we would have some idea about how the energy changes. Uh, how, what is the energy of the new, of the new wave function, u times psi? OK, so the first, there is a small observation, which is that uh, let's look at this term for a second. This term, if we were to sum over i over this, over this indices here, so there would be some sign. And there would be some sum over i over some local operators. And let's assume that their matrix elements are order one in the state, in the ground state. And uh, therefore, you would get something of order one over L in the large L, limit, large L limit times something of order L. And so this would be really, really bad. So if we can't prove that the matrix elements of this guy vanish, then we're in trouble. Because it would be something of order one over L times something of order L in the continuum limit. So since we're interested in the ground state wave function u, and then a um, si, si plus 1 sum u minus sum si, si plus 1. That's what we're interested in. This is the delta of the energy. So this is the, the, ch the change in the average energy of the state u psi compared to the state psi. So for this to be of order 1 over L, we need this to exactly cancel. And indeed, you can, make sure you can just uh, check that the commutator of our original Hamiltonian with what appears here in the numerator exactly gives that guy. So this commutator exactly gives this operator. So S X I S Y I plus one minus S Y I X I plus one. And therefore in energy eigenstates, the first term that we've encountered exactly vanishes. Is there a question about it? Is this okay? So this is something that you can just easily verify from the SU2 algebra. So this term goes away. And the on, only the second term remains. But now we're in good shape. Because this is of order 1 over L squared. And this is just a bunch of matrix elements of order 1. So there are L of them. And therefore, we get something of order L. So therefore, we've already proved that this is of order 1 over L. But we haven't yet used that the spins are half integer. That comes next. So why is it yet why why isn't the proof complete yet? Let's see if somebody's still following. Why isn't it not enough to show that this delta energy is one over L? What else do we need to show? <laughs> exactly. We need to show that the new I, that the new state that we've constructed is orthogonal to the ground state. So we need to show that psi u psi zero. Once we do that, we're done. And here, the half integer nature of the spins would be important. And how do we do that? Here, we need to use the translational symmetry, crucially. We haven't used that yet. And here it comes, uh, here, it's, uh, here it's crucial. So let's first ask a basic question. What happens when we act with the translational symmetry? on our ground state psi, on our famous ground state psi. What does it do? Does anybody have a suggestion? Hmm? It's what? It's right. It, it's invariant, or more generally, you could get a phase. So the projective ground state is invariant. 
So therefore, we can write the following equation. Psi u psi is the same as psi t minus 1 u t psi. OK? So now we need to conjugate our operator u by translation. And that's very easy. We just shift this index. We just move the operator sj to the j plus 1 side. So let's conjugate our operator u by, trans by translation. So we get 2 pi i over L. But now the sum over j is a little bit different. We get j sj plus 1, z. And this plus 1 is crucial. So now we need to relate this new operator to the previous operator u to get to some, in, to get some interesting equation. Say again. Since the space is unique, don't you know that you cannot have this space? How come? If this space was non zero, then by acting with a reflection. Reflection like what? On space. Yes. You would get the minor power right? Okay, so it's another phase. You just get the ground state up to. You're asking, let's act with t again, but t is anti-unitary. Is that what you're worried about, acting with t again? Or you want to act with something else? I'm just saying, if the state, if the ground state has some non-zero momentum, then reflection can tell me that, that the state which is reflected, which has opposite momentum, which has the same energy, so the ground state would not be degenerate. So since we know it's unique, don't we know it's translation invariant exactly? Yeah, but only the projectively. Only projectively. I, I don't see how you can get I don't see how you can get a contradiction with this. We should we can try to see if it, you can run into a contradiction, but regardless this would be true. Well, let me just give you an example of something of that sort that you know. Uh, let's, for example, in a CFT, uh, Joao, in a CFT with a gravitational anomaly, the ground state has a fractional momentum, even though it's unique. Fractional momentum C left minus C right over 24. Right? It's a fractional momentum that the ground state may acquire, even though it's unique. It does not lead to a contradiction. Mm -hmm. no well, the algebra of this uh, in parity could be centrally extended. You don't know what's the algebra a priori. You have to work on it. You have to work it out. It's okay. I, I can put it to zero if you'll be more happy. It would not. Uh, okay. So there is this. Uh, we need to. We need to uh, rewrite this operator in terms of the operator u. And uh, so how do we do that? So we just need to add j plus 1 and then subtract what we've missed, right? So suppose you added plus 1 and then subtracted what you've uh, overcounted for. So that would be the same as u. But there will be one piece missing. What is that? There will be just one term that we are missing if we add plus 1 and subtract. So it's almost the same as u. but uh, it's different by uh, 2 pi i over L <coughs> times the first spin, right? Just the first guy, S1z. Let me just see if this is the same notation I've had before. Yeah, so that's the, that would be the same notation. Let me just write it a little bit bigger. So it's an exponential of 2 pi i over L <coughs> S1z. Okay? 
and this guy so now we'll plug it back sorry this is without an L let's do pi i s one z So there is another piece which is unimportant. And then you. And then this guy. Okay. So what, what does that mean? Sorry, can you write that first term a little later? Okay. I'll, I'll switch to a new blackboard. So do, do you want me to do the algebra here to see how that simplifies to something that's similar to you up to a few factors? That would be great. Okay. So we have exponential of 2 pi i over L times the sum over S uh, j, j plus 1, right? So now this is the same as e to the 2 pi i over L sum over j plus 1, s j plus 1, z. But now we need to subtract something. So uh, in my convention, we would need to subtract minus 2 pi i over L uh, sum over s j z. But that's not good enough because we screwed up one term. So we need to add it back. Two pi i s one z. Okay, from 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 j over l because you plug j over l and it cancels the l. Okay, so what we find is the following equation: psi u psi. From this manipulation here, we find that it's the same. Uh, after, after we plug that back, this is the same as u. This is the total, well, this is just the magnetization, which we already dis discussed to, that it's zero. So this can be discarded. And all that remains is this guy. So we find the following deep equation. This is like the spin at the first side. Times psi u psi. So that implies that if the spin is a half integer, then the, then the state u psi is orthogonal to psi. And then we're done. Then we're done. And for integer spin, this equation is useless. Doesn't teach you anything. And let's see. So we see that uh, this, anti this chain with half integer spin is non-generic in that, that there is a non-zero, that is gapless in the continuum limit. So it's a very non-generic uh, chain. And now, a, yeah? Yes. Yes. Well, even that state could have uh, energy much less than 1 over L. I did not show that it was 1 over L. It could be exponentially small, right? Because all the 1 over L estimate came from saying, OK, we have 1 over L squared times L terms of order 1. But they could cancel. And it could be even much smaller than 1 over L. So we don't know a priori. Any other questions? So this, yes? Can you spin aside one of your Say again? Yeah, some, some spin, some spin. I mean, if you try to play with chains where there are several types of spins, then you would run into like all sorts of confusion. This is just like, you know, I could have done this reshuffling in any way I wanted. I could have picked up any, any spin that I want, yeah. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. I assume translational symmetry? Oh. Yeah, yeah. This thing is two stars of just the sum over x, y, and z, which is just a Hamiltonian. So in fact, it's a constant, and it does not uh, support a change to flow. You, you, you're appealing to some infield? Uh, no, oh. not to infield, because it's just a Hamiltonian. It's, just it's a almost the Hamiltonian. It's not exactly the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian has another term. Yeah, but that term is exactly equal to, I mean, if once we compute the energy, x, y, and z for the ground state, each term is going to give the same answer. Why? Why do we care? This is one example of the same. And it's, it'd be great to show that. Well, we care because it seems, it seems like I cannot overrule the hypothesis. Okay, it's fine. I don't think so. That's the one you said. Right. In principle, it doesn't matter. But you can always try to prove more. Okay. I'm done with the lattice, and now I will show you a parallel story in the continuum. And most important, w there will be many important uh, points which are kind of unintuitive and new. And luckily, which I did not expect, Shota's talk would allow me to quickly go through some part that I wanted to explain, but now I don't need to explain it. So now I'm going to tell you about the QFT interpretation of this model, the long distance limit. And, <clears throat> and we'll see many of the features that we've seen on the lattice come back. And this theorem, we, could, we will also be able to derive it directly in the continuum uh, in a much more streamlined fashion. So that's really nice. That's one of the this recent the developments that I mentioned that uh, it has been understood recently that this kind of theorems can be derived in the continuum in a much more streamlined fashion and uh, that led to many new constructions of that sort. So now let's discuss the quantum field theory that uh, will be sort of mirroring the physics of this model. Initially, it's not going to be clear why this particular quantum field theory has anything to do. But as we, as we develop some intuition and analyze this model, you'll see more and more of the features that we've uh, that we've seen on the lattice appear in the, con in the continuum. <coughs> uh, this is phi i, so let me just write it phi i squared. So phi i, which is phi 1 and phi 2, are two uh, fields, quantum fields, of charge one. So these are two fields of charge one. Under the gauge symmetry, uh, under the gauge symmetry, under the gauge field F, A, and such that the covariant derivative is what you know from grad school, and the, f the curvature, F, is dA, as usual. OK, so we'll study this model and some deformation of this model. And that will mirror very much the physics of the spin chain. So first, let's discuss the symmetries. Let's discuss the symmetries of this model. Then we'll discuss the phases of this model. And then we'll make contact with the spin chain. When did I start? Uh, I forgot. 30 minutes ago? Good. Yeah? OK, so I'll analyze this model rather, uh, rather pedagogically, uh, starting from very basic things and gradually going to more and more sophisticated things. So what are the symmetries? I'll just help the audience would participate. <laughs> what are the symmetries of this model? 
and, and just unitary symmetries. Let's forget about space-time symmetries. Any suggestion? What are the symmetries? Hmm? SO2. SO2. So the symmetries, there is SU2 acting on the two fields, phi1 and phi2, since they are complex fields, right? So you have phi1 and phi2. They can transform with an arbitrary SU2 matrix. Why not U2? Why am I saying SU2? Because they the center of the U2 has the U2 U2 has a U1, and the U1 would give the same phase to both phi1 and phi2, but that's already accounted for by the dynamical gauge field A. Okay, so it's not an independent global symmetry, and in fact, even SU2 has a matrix which is a central matrix, so minus one, minus one. That's an SU2 matrix, right? That is already accounted for by the gauge symmetry as well. Right? Because it acts, the it acts in the same way on phi 1 and phi 2. So it's the same as a gauge transformation by 180 degrees. So in fact, if you want to be really pedantic, uh, the symmetry of the model is not SU2, but SU2 mod Z2, which is also known as SO3. OK? So that's the real group that acts faithfully. So SO3 is the group that acts faithfully on the space of local operators. On local operators. In addition, there is a very important symmetry. It will turn out to play a very important role, which is charge conjugation symmetry, which I'm going to denote by C. And it acts by taking phi i to phi i star and by reversing the sign of the gauge field. Charge conjugation and SO3 symmetry do not commute. And uh, one homework exercise is for you to work out the commutation relations of this action and this action, and you will see that they together combine to all three. Okay. In fact, this notion of charge conjugation does not commute with SO3. But you can modify it a little bit by combining this with an SU2 rotation so that, such that it would co commute with SO3. And then it would, it would manifestly be O3. That's the easiest way to solve this exercise, to show that, uh, to construct a slightly different uh, charge conjugation action. OK, so this model has O3 symmetry. Now, we are going to analyze some of its phases. The first claim that I want to make, this, is the, this claim is a kind of almost empty of content, but you'll see what it, like why am I making this claim. This, mo this, this model that we just wrote down is basically in the same universality class as the integer spin model. As the integer spin model. Well, the integer spin model on the lattice was gapped. So its universality class is essentially trivial. And this model is also going to be trivial. So they're in the same universality class in some empty sense. In some, in some sense, it's empty. Uh, so let's just make sure that this is right. So what are the parameters that we can vary? Let's choose the potential to be the norm of phi i. OK, let me write it more explicitly. Let the potential be m squared phi i squared plus lambda phi i squared squared. So this is a nice O3 preserving potential. And we're going to try to study the various phases of this model as we change m squared. So let's try to change the m squared, the parameter m squared, compared to the various other parameters in the model, and see what phases do we land on. So first, let's take m squared, since this is the model that Shota, soon we'll see that there is some connection with the model that uh, Shota described. So let's start from negative m squared, but so negative that you can do semi-classical analysis. So m squared would be much, much bigger in absolute value than E squared, lambda, and all the other parameters. 
So this model can be analyzed semi-classically because m squared is just huge and negative. So then the, the fields phi condense, right? Uh, because, sorry, the potential needs to be minimized and phi's would, the phi's would condense. So the phi's would condense and the gauge field dynamics would disappear. So there won't be any gauge field left. It will be massive like in the Higgs mechanism. But there will be some number Goldstones uh, that remain. So what will happen to the SL3 symmetry? What will happen to the SL3 symmetry in the vacuum? Anybody has a guess? So we condense the fields like that, right? We can just without loss of generality, condense the field like that. And this will be some real V and this will be some zero. And this is acted upon by SU2. So what group is preserved by this wave? U1? None. None? So? Right, it seems like this completely breaks SU2. But you have to remember that the gauge symmetry acts from the right. So one way to think about it is that we have an SU2 matrix that acts on the left, but then there are gauge transformations that act from the right. So when we ask which global symmetries are preserved, we are always allowed to combine global symmetries with gauge symmetries. So while the SU2, SU2 matrix by itself does not leave that invariant because it multiplies this upper component by a phase, we can cancel that by doing an appropriate gauge transformation. So therefore, SO3 is broken to SO2. And therefore, in this limit, we get the, the O3 sigma model that Chota described. So we, just, we, get, we get number Goldstone bosons living on a sphere. And that model is also known as the SO3 nonlinear sigma model. And what did Chota tell us about the infrared of this model? Gl massive gap. So this is trivial. Good. So that's good because we expect the integer spin model to be trivial. Now let's quickly analyze the other limit and we'll be done with the trivial part of the story. Let's analyze uh, the other limit where m squared is positive and in fact much, much bigger than e squared and lambda. Sorry, yes? Right. So that's a very good remark. Let me explain what's going on. So you go to, you go to, you go to the Higgs branch, U1, the U1 disappears, and your effective theory below the scale of the VEV is given by the model that uh, Schotter described. Now this model uh, has an O3 symmetry that's realized nonlinearly because there are two fields and O3. So O3 acts nonlinearly, right? Now this model develops a gap, but this gap is exponentially small in the scale of the VEV over the electric charge. So the gap here is exponentially small, but it's nevertheless a gap. And then the O3, sig and the O3 symmetry is eventually restored, and it's realized linearly on the empty vacuum. So O3 is restored, but it's real, real so this is like a good intermediate description. There isn't symmetry breaking in the vacuum, there is a sigma model on the target space, which is the coset, and then this, target, then this model restores SO3 dynamically in the infrared, and in fact, it's massive. It's a very good remark. Sorry that I did not say it. Is it clear? Should I repeat the question? Does anybody want me to repeat the question? Okay. Right, so the question is, I said that, okay, let me repeat the question. The question was, SO3 is broken to SO2 here, as we've done, as we've shown. But Shota, Shota argued that the O3 sigma model does not break O3. So what's going on? That's the question. So the point is that there are several scales. The first scale that you encounter is the scale of the VEV V. At that scale, the gauge field disappears and the radial mode disappears. So below that scale, the effective theory is given by this model, where n squared is 1. So this is a, a sigma model where the target space is a two-sphere. And here, the O3 symmetry seems to be spontaneously broken. 
but it's not, but we're not yet saying that the O3, that the SO3 symmetry is spontaneously broken by the vacuum. We haven't constructed the vacuum yet. And in two dimensions, there are strong infrared fluctuations that in fact restore the SO3 symmetry. So the SO3 symmetry seems to be spontaneously broken at an intermediate scale, but not in the true vacuum. The true vacuum is in fact gapped and SO3 symmetric. Okay, so SO3 acting on the true vacuum is uh, in fact, uh, okay, is that clear? Okay, is that okay? So this is a tricky thing, but this, is, this has to do with Coleman's theorem, which should be mentioned. So Coleman proved the theorem that symmetries cannot be spontaneously broken in two dimensions. So any such description where the symmetry seems to be spontaneously broken is only intermediate, of intermediate value. Like in some energy scale, uh, let's say here, this description is good between the scale V and the scale of the gap, which is exponentially small in V. It's exponential in minus V over E squared. So there is a good, there is a huge energy scale, energy regime here where this description is good. But eventually it's not. But not linearly, not linearly, yes. not linearly, right? Yes. Because if you actually asked how does the SO3 act on these vector fields n, some of them will have inhomogeneous terms. They'll be shifted by inhomogeneous pieces. Yes, I think if you made measurements at this intermediate, uh, intermediate energy scale, you would see two scalars, two degrees of freedom and you would be confused. How can SO3 act on two degrees of freedom? You want three. No, no, but when you make measurements, at in, when you make local measurements, uh, you don't see the whole topology of the target space. Suppose you just measure its scattering. So you could say, let's fix n z squared to be n x squared, sorry. You could say, you can solve this constraint by saying n z squared is uh, minus one, well, sorry, one minus nx squared minus ny squared. Then you could plug it back and you would get a nonlinear model that looks like dnx. So dnx squared plus dny squared plus interactions. Like there will be terms like n, nx and y, dnx, dny, maybe things like that. <clears throat> so if you could measure these vertices, you would be, you would not see, I mean, in this description, only SO2 would be manifest. If you actually measure these vertices, only SO2 would be manifest. And to see SO3, you will have to like make infinitely many measurements and see that all these coefficients conspire to give you an SO3 invariant model. Yes, that's true. You need to make some... No, why? I don't think so. I, I, there is a huge energy scale where this is a good description. So, like even in the O3 model, you can just ask this question about the O3 model, right? You can ask this question about the O3 model. You can take the... Good, so let's take, you can, for, for example, look at the S matrix that uh, Shota constructed. And you can ask, can we measure the beta function? There is a beta function here in the UV. Can we see it from the S matrix? And the answer is yes. And the beta function knows about all these terms. So you can measure the running of all these terms from the asymptotic high energy limit of the S matrix. And it has been done. I think the Zemalochikov did it in some paper. Yes, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there is some energy range where this description is good. And the way to do it is, for example, you take the S matrix that Schotta constructed and you can extract from it the beta function. Is Schotta here? You didn't show that, right? Sorry? Uh, you didn't show this uh, exercise with the beta function, right? I didn't. But the Zemalochikovs did that and they've shown that uh, the beta functions respect, you know, the, one of the tests of this uh, integrable S matrix that Schotta gave is not just the large N expansion, but it's also the beta function in the UV, which they matched with the beta function that you compute from the nonlinear sigma model. No, 
no, no, that, that no, just. No, yeah, that, of course. The vacuum is also drain variant. Okay. No, so if you st once you have this description, n is dimensionless, and d has dimension one, so therefore the coefficient here is dimensionless. And this, coefficients run, this coefficient runs logarithmically, and then there is dimensional transmutation. So you can ask, what is this coefficient in this model that we're studying? And the answer is that uh, if the VEV of the field phi is huge, this coefficient is gonna be very small. It's weakly coupled, like h bar is very small. So, sorry, so in this convention, this would be huge in the limit where the VEV is huge. So h bar is tiny, and this is very weakly coupled, and you can compute the beta function. And dimensional transmutation takes place at this scale, which is more or less e to the minus. So, you know, it's a dimensionless number, so you need, so there is like a, several decades of energy that you need to evolve before the beta function blows up. So that's why there is like an exponentially, exponentially large suppression here. Oh yeah, yeah, completely correct, yes. The gap is the same scale as the masses of the particles that Chota computed. It's exactly the same scale. But that scale is, is exponentially small in this, in this, in, in H bar. Because this is like one over H bar here. Good, so this phase of the model is trivial. I'll buy it in an interesting way, but it's still trivial. This phase of the model, you can just integrate out the scalars because their mass is huge, so you can forget about them. Uh, the, their, their dynamics freezes out way before the gauge field becomes important. So the effective field theory is just F squared. So it's Maxwell, Maxwell in a one plus one dimensions. What is the dynamics of Maxwell in one plus one dimensions? What is the ground state? Where the ground state is just zero electric field. Just the trivial ground state, all the symmetries are preserved, uh, all the, and, and that's it. So it's all three invariant. And it's gap. There is no photon, as you remember, in one plus one dimensions, crucially. Since there is no photon, this ground state is gap. So we've seen that this model reproduces the empty physics of the integer spin chain. Very interestingly. There are, of course, many other models that reproduce this empty physics. Now, now I'll show you the really cool thing. The really cool thing is that there is a deformation of this model where you can prove in the continuum, which is very rare, that the model is gapless, or that the model is non-trivial. And furthermore, it will reproduce lots of the properties that we found of the spin chain. Yes? So is there a catalog in the spin chain description of going from this non-trivial gap description to the trivial gap description as you choose the M squared from very negative to very positive? Both of them are trivial gapped. In right, the in a different way, but as you, but not, look something, so this, uh, this range, if you, if you make the mass smaller and smaller, this range becomes smaller and smaller, and eventually there isn't like any effective range where this, this is even true. So as you change the mass, all you can see at long distances is unbroken O3 and trivially gapped vacua. And this model has no phase transitions. That's a great question. I do not know the answer, but it's a, it's a very good question. <coughs> um, okay, so now we'll study a small twist of this model that's only possible in, this, in the sequence of models that Shota described. The twist that we're going to describe is only possible for all three. So now we had a small twist. And that's where it becomes really interesting and makes contact with the bootstrap. So we go back to our Lagrangian and we observe that we could have added another term, which we did not. And that term would lead to all this magic that starts discrete anomalies and deconfined crit criticality. So we could add the following term. This is DA. Okay. This is called the theta term. And this you could do for the ON models just for O3. But for this, for this okay. So, 
So in components, what I mean is theta over 2 pi, epsilon mu nu, d mu, a nu. So it's like a total derivative. OK? Maybe you need a half here. And now I'll analyze this model. So first of all, it preserves the SL3 symmetry. There is nothing bad that happens with the SL3 symmetry. Now I'm going to explain a property of this model that will be important, which is that theta is a new parameter in the model. It's a new continuous parameter that labels the theory. But it's actually 2 pi periodic. Like they, you, may, you may have seen that in the past. Uh, two, the theta parameters are often periodic. And this theta parameter is 2 pi periodic just because integrals over dA over any closed 2 manifold are given by integers. So this is, this is a famous fact about U1 connections that the field strength integrates to an integer. That's called the first chain class. Yes? What about the O series? Yes, yes, I'm getting there. So I'm arguing first that uh, I'm, the first thing that I wanted to argue is that theta is a new parameter, but it does not lead to a new line of theories. It leads to a circle of theories because theta is 2 pi periodic. The model where theta is 2 pi is the same as the model where theta is 0 because the pass integral over any compact space would be exactly the same because on compact spaces, this is quantized. So the pass integral is exactly the same. The observables are exactly the same, and there is no distinction. So since theta lives on a circle, there is a special point on this. So what does charge conjugation do? Charge conjugation takes a to minus a, and therefore it takes theta to minus theta. So clearly the model at theta equals 0 that we've studied before is charge conjugation invariant. But there is another charge conjugation invariant model, which is that equals pi. And that's the model that is dual to the spin chain with a half integer charges. So there is another way to get O3 symmetry, which is to put that equals pi. Okay? So we'll now analyze the phases of the model at theta equals pi, and we'll see that something really strange happens. Uh, something that we may not be used to from studying Landau Ginzburg like models. Good. Fantastic question. I, 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 please remind, if I don't answer this question, that I, I did something wrong. Please remind me of that in uh, like 10 minutes. There is a discrepancy. Uh, what Slava is saying is that the model, the local operators in this model transform under O3. The local operators on the spin chain transformed under SU2. So there is a mismatch. But you'll see that something really funny happens that explains this discrepancy. <coughs> okay. Uh, le let's just analyze the phases of this model, starting again from the phase that we all like, where the mass is negative and the fields condense. So it's again negative and huge. So we get very, something very similar. There is this intermediate energy range where we can use the variables of the O3 nonlinear sigma model that Shota described. So we still have that because this is really the same as what we had before. But now there is something new because of theta. So what does this term do deep in the Higgs phase? This is classical physics. So you can really find the answer of what theta does uh, on the Higgs, in this deep Higgs phase by uh, solving the equations of motion for phi, solving the equations of motion for the gauge field A, plugging it back into the action, and expressing it in terms of N. So it turns out that it adds, you need to add the following term, theta over 2 pi n dot dn cross dn. So this is the usual cross product among three vectors. And that's why it's only possible for the O3 model. Now, this term is, the, is, is known from topology. If you have S2 and you map it into S2, Imagine that S2 is your base space and S2 is the target space. Then th this term, in, in, when we integrate this term, 
then this measures the second homotopy group of S2, so it's an integer. In some, in some normalization. So this mirrors very nicely this fact. The, in, the, integ the integral nature of the train class is the same as the second homotopy group for S2 in this language. So this is why theta is periodic in this language. But we've already, we are setting theta to pi, right? I did it for generic theta, but we're actually interested only at theta equals pi, not at generic theta, because we're interested in preserving charge conjugation symmetry. Is this clear? OK. So this is an interesting deformation of the O3 model. The O3 model is integrable, as Shota taught us. And it turns out that the theta equals pi model is also integrable. And also for that model, the S matrix was written by Zomological. And what did he find? He found that unlike the O3 model that Shota described, this model is actually massless. So it does not have this develop a gap. It's massless, and SO3 symmetry is realized linearly. It's not broken in the vacuum because of Coleman's theorem. It flows to the SU2 level one West Zumino Witten model, where the SU2 symmetry is enhanced to SU2 left times SU2 right, as usual in two-dimensional conformal filters. So it's gapless. Okay, so this small and the uh, <clears throat> Naive looking deformation, in fact, changes the physics very dramatically. And now the model is gapless and still integrable, at least in this energy range. Okay. Right. So this is the funny case where they constructed the S matrix for some particles, but actually there is a gapless sector. You, this is what Zomologikov did that in 92 or 91. So even though it's a gapless model, he constructed an S matrix for some massive particle exactly. Does it make sense? Apparently, yeah. Well, it's a gapless model, but there are massive resonances too. There are some massless particles, but there are also massive resonances. So the evidence, Zamalachikov constructed an S matrix, and the evidence that it, his S matrix describes this model is again by going to the high energy limit and checking beta functions. That's, uh, that's what he argues. Well, you just, uh, you just look, you see that there are singularities all the way to zero energy. The S matrix has singularities all the way. The branch cut continues all the way to zero energy. OK. So we see that this model is gapless when the mass squared is huge and negative. Now let's see when, what happens when the mass squared is huge and positive. In that case, we can again integrate out the scalars. But now the effective filter is slightly different from before. We have theta over 2 pi times f. This is now the effective theory, and we have to put theta equals pi. So this is U1 electrodynamics with a funny theta term. There is an old work from the 70s by uh, Coleman, Saskind, others, uh, where they studied this deformation of U1 electro U1 no, Maxwell theory in one plus one dimensions. And what they found is that this theta term for pure U1 can be interpreted as a, like a background charge at infinity. And theta equals pi corresponds to a half integer charge. So in fact, the ground state is twofold degenerate. You, there are two ground states that are exactly degenerate. One is the electric field is plus a half, and one is when the electric field is minus a half. So it's just constant electric field filling out space but it could be either plus a half or minus a half. And they're exactly degenerate. And uh, this, so we have two ground states now. And they're related by charge conjugation symmetry. Since charge conjugation reverses the sign of the electric field, so we have two vacua. Vacuum one, and this goes to vacuum two by charge conjugation symmetry. 
So we see that O3 symmetry is spontaneously broken to SO3. So charge conjugation is spontaneously broken. And this does not contradict Coleman's theorem because charge conjugation is a discrete symmetry. So it's allowed to be spontaneously broken in one plus one dimensions. So let's uh, draw the phases of this model. Now summarize the phases. Actually, this is a, you could just solve this model. It's a quadratic field theory. So it's a straightforward exercise to just solve this model at home and see that it got two ground states at theta equals pi. Right. Are, are you working on the complex manifolds or not? Or how can you construct these ground states? Uh, these are super selection sectors at infinite volume. We put constant. Before I said that the electric field on compact spaces has to be quantized. And now I'm using a half integer electric field. But this, uh, I'm talking about super selection sectors in infinite space now. If you put them in compact space, they would mix and there will be a gap of order exponen exponentially small gap. Yeah, theta, so theta labels theories, but only mod 2 pi. Because uh, on any compact space, the pass integral with theta equals 2 pi is the same as the one with theta equals 0. So theta labels theories only mod, mod 2 pi. Okay? Yeah, so are you in compact space in the infinite size Now I'm analyzing the phases of the model in infinite space at theta equals pi. No, he, he has, well, he has many integrable S matrices. But is, is, this, is the O3 model with integrable pi actually integrable? Yes, yes. But yes. that's not what, what, what I was unlocking. I thought that was for the principle of power model. Because just as you prove where you change the ratio. No, no, no. He, he talked about the O3 sigma model with this term. And in fact, he even has a follow-up paper where he squashed the sphere. He took, this is like for a round sphere with a theta term. He has a follow-up paper where he constructed the sausage but with a theta term, and he still showed that this is an integrable deformation. Yeah. So uh, this, by the way, is also interesting, this deformation to a sausage. OK. I want to finish this lecture with um, the phase diagram and some theorem that we'll prove next time. So let's draw the phases. What did we find so far? A huge positive m squared. We have two vacua. Charge conjugation is broken. I'm not writing SO3 because SO3 is never broken. We're in two dimensions, so continuous symmetries cannot be broken. So here we have two vacua and charge conjugation symmetry is broken. So these two vacua are connected by charge conjugation. Then there could be some phase transition. And past that phase transition, we have a conformal filter, SC2 level 1 was Zumino Witten. So this is gapless. And charge conjugation is not broken. OK, so this is a conformal field theory. And this is a gap, but degenerate state. So we see that this model cannot be completely disordered. Like all the, all, all the regimes that we could access with semi-classical physics have shown that the ground state is non-trivial. So the claim that I would prove next time using, I'll introduce discrete anomalies in the continuum and prove that uh, in this model, in this model, for any m squared, you have to either break charge conjugation symmetry or have a conformal field theory. You can just prove it. Even though we cannot solve quantum field theory, in this model, we can prove that for any m squared, either charge conjugation is broken or gapless in the continuum. Gapless in the continuum. So you have some conformal field theory. So this is a rare case where you can just prove a rigorous theorem in quantum field theory. And that mirrors very much the lattice construction that had this persistent gap that we could not get rid of. Let me now, uh, just the last five minutes, I'll make two comments uh, just to perhaps tease you for the next uh, session. 
Uh, one is the question that Slav asked. So the, there is a small mismatch between the symmetries here because the continuum model has O3 symmetry while the lattice model has SU2. But notice a small thing. The lattice model has operators transforming under SU2, but if you look at bilinears, it always transforms under SO3 because the spin is integer for bilinears. So the operators that transform under SO3 are in fact single spin insertions. What I will explain next time is that those do not map to local operators in, in the continuum limit. They become uh, kinks or lines or domain walls. So those will become domain walls. In some sense, they'll have infinite energy. They're not going to be physical excitations at infinite volume. Yes? Good. And then, this, so we'll argue that the SU2 mismatch is because uh, these operators are not local operators in space time. They do not act within a given ground state, rather, they change the ground state. So they allow you to hop from this ground state to this ground state. That's why there is a mismatch in the symmetries. The second thing is that there is charge conjugation symmetry in space time. And we will argue that that has to do with translational symmetry on the lattice. So the translation symmetry on the lattice by one unit becomes charge conjugation in space time. Okay? So these are two counterintuitive things. Local operators on the lattice do not have to become local operators in space time. Translational symmetry on the lattice do not have to be anti-unitary in space time. They can be unitary. And we'll match all these things by a careful analysis of domain walls, the discrete anomalies, many, many things uh, of that sort. D is translation, right? So why are you saying it's anti-unitary? I, I meant space-time. Okay. So space-time symmetries on the lattice do not have to become space-time symmetries in the and continuum. And what's the gap on the right-hand side above the two states? Is it yeah, it's parametrically very large. Okay. It's parametrically very large. So you remember the analysis of the, con of the lattice model yeah. did not allow us to distinguish these two scenarios. And indeed, the, con the continuum quantum field theory has a continuous parameter that allows you to hop between these two, par between these two scenarios. So these models are like protected by some discrete anomaly and associated to these things. And that's why these models can never be trivially gapped. Is the analog of this active node the spin model? Yes. Uh, people have uh, studied some quartic deformations. Uh, like deformations that are either higher power in the spin or span over more nearest neighbor in, near, more neighboring uh, spins, and you can actually get to that phase. So the model that I actually wrote is uh, in this phase, but it has natural deformations where the matrix elements still obey Frobenius Perron, and which still obeys this theorem that there is a gap uh, in finite L, but it's becoming gapless at infinite L. So you can deform the model without changing anything that I said and hop to that state. Yes, and we can identify this in terms of some spin-ons in the antiferromagnet. Yeah. And the SU2 symmetry in the continuum is enhanced to SU2 times SU2, as you remember, from conformal field theory. That's extremely non-obvious from the lattice point of view. This is like an emergent symmetry at long distances. Yes? Right. How does this become SU2 uh, for the WW model? This? This is the symmetry. The WZW model has a huge enhanced symmetry. It's SU2 times SU2. Right, but uh, in particular, does it have O3? It also has a, an additional discrete symmetry that interchanges the two SU2s, and that uh, descends from our charge conjugation symmetry. What this is this is this uh, this this thing that I wrote here, SU2 level one was omino Witten, this is not the symmetry, this is the name of the model. It has even more, it has SU2 times SU2 and uh, some additional discrete symmetry. There is a huge emergent symmetry in the infrared. You, if you want to understand why SU2, there is an intuitive explanation. We will talk about it next time. We'll see that there are deconfined 
deconfined uh, SU2 doublets on the kink. And the physics is that the kink becomes massless. And this deconfined SU2 doublet proliferates. So there is some kind of pictorial understanding of where this SU2 com comes from. Yes? So notice that this transition is not like a usual conformal filter. Usually you have a phase diagram and conformal filters appear at code dimension one. So there is a conformal filter, some massive phase one and some massive phase two. And maybe some of the phases break some discrete symmetries. So this is how the Ising transition appears. There is a trivially gapped vacuum here, a discrete symmetry breaking vacuum here and the Ising model interpolates. This is not the case here. This is non Landau Ginzburg. You can never get something like that from ordinary scalar fields with some potential. So we have discrete symmetry breaking here, but here there is a conformal filter for any m squared. So the transit and this conformal filter, this, so this transition is of a different sort. You see, the CFT here is not called dimension one, it's called dimension zero. This transition is very similar to what they call BKT. The BKT transition is of this sort. It's like a massive phase that becomes a conformal filter, and that's it. There is never a trivially gapped phase. So this is, this is beyond what you can get from scalar fields with potentials. It has, I mean, there is some discrete anomaly lurking here, that's con that, and, and that's why you can get all these funny things. You cannot get it from a trivial uh, theory. Yes, yes, it's like an irrelevant perturbation. Yeah, by the, the M squared, what it controls intuitively is the size of the sphere. But this model doesn't care what's the size of the UV sphere. It always flows to a gapless phase. So it's like an irrelevant perturbation from the SU2 level one point of view. Completely agree. No, no, you need to make sure that this matrix elements were non-negative, but there's a huge, wide, huge class of models where this is still true. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's the thing I worry about, worry about because yesterday you were showing that the M, M equals zero block, uh, that matrix, like, let's call it A, use the ratio to some power and show that that's positive, and the power will be over what is L, I presume. Yes. Um, and so it's not obvious that for small perturbation that no, what you need to worry about is that the first ma that the matrix that you get before you raise it to any power has non-negative entries. Then it's kind of guaranteed that it's going to work. And that's it. Because you raise it to some power, it will all, popu all the entries will be populated eventually. And this is extremely easy to guarantee. They have <coughs> thousands of different papers on models that still obey this property. And in particular, they can also like jump to that phase with the nonlinear deformation. That's what I just said. Not from the spin chain I gave you, but from a slightly more complicated spin chain where you add a quartic term, you can see it. Yeah, you just need to add a quartic term with some next to nearest neighbor interactions, but it still preserves Frobenius Peron, still has a gap at finite volume, gapless at infinite volume, and it goes to this phase. 